from the fungus-infested Univest Studios at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. It is time for another blighted episode of Chemical Free Horticultural Hijinks. You betcha, God. Arbor Vitae seem to be turning brown all over town. I'm your host, Mike McGrath, and on today's show, I'll reveal what I've learned about Arbor Vitae blight and what you can do to stop it or at least slow it down. Plus, yes, we will take that heap and helping of your fabulous phone call, questions, comments, tips, tricks, suggestions, and haughtily harassing harumphifications. So keep your eyes and or ears right here, cats and kittens, because it's all coming up faster than you turning those brown spots back to green right after this. Support for You Bet Your Garden is provided by the Espoma Company, offering a complete selection of natural organic plant foods and potting soils. More information about Espoma and the Espoma Natural Gardening Community can be found at ESPOMA.com. Welcome to another thrilling episode of You Bet Your Garden from the Univest Studios at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. But I must acknowledge that my mind is in Philadelphia right now. I am not getting ahead of myself. I don't want to throw a Kenahara at the team. So I'm just wearing my National League pennant Phillies gear. And, hey, come on, kids. The pennant is something. You get a ring, you know. And Bobby the bobblehead is excited about games, too, aren't you, Bobby? Yes, once again, kids, I have lost it. But I'll pull it together to take a couple of your fabulous phone calls at 888-492-9444. Jennifer, welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Well, thank you. How you doing, Jen? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm just ducky. All right, where, <laughs> where are you? Um, we are, uh, well, I'm actually at work, which is in northern Kentucky, but I live in Cincinnati, Ohio. Okay. So I presume your question is about Cincy. Yes. All right. What do you got? So I live in a pretty urban setting on, uh, Cincinnati is pretty hilly mm-hmm. and, uh, we're right near downtown and, and our hill, our house is on the side of a hill and built in 1865 it's an older home Mm -hmm. and we have two large stone i guess you would call them stone planters in front of the house instead of a regular yard Mm -hmm. Um, obviously we didn't have a garage in 1865 so (laughs) they were put in um, wait a minute after that where'd they where'd, where'd they keep the horse i'm not sure i'm not sure maybe on the sidewalk (laughs) But yeah, so the, the, when they, I think when they built the garage, they put these stone planters in because originally uh, it was just kind of a giant planter. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, this was we just moved there two years ago, and I think what's happened is I kind of did this last. It was filled with, of course, boxwoods and a weeping cherry tree. So I took those down since we had kind of a nice fall, and when I went to go into the soil the soil was hard so i thought oh it's just dry so i got it wet and it's not just dry it's dry and awful there's <laughs> it's dusty and i don't know how else to explain it I, I i can't say i'm the most you know seasoned gardener but i couldn't even find a worm in my soil i it, it's just in the, the tree pretty much just fell over when I pushed on it you know after I cut one one um, you know one of the roots it just fell over and I it makes sense now because I really couldn't get anything to grow in there okay but I was just wondering how do I make it better (laughs) so uh, the terrible soil where did it come from I have no idea Um, I'm assuming it's I think the people that owned the house before us and the people, you know, they they redid this, we think, around 1995. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to bet that's probably because the tree was definitely looking like it was in its 
you know, it was at its end of its life. So I was thinking it was around 30 years old anyway. So you so didn't I'm plant. I'm thinking they haven't done anything. You didn't plant any of these. No, I did not. Okay. Um, just curiously, why were you taking out the cherry tree? Uh, the cherry tree had um, it had gotten some of those big boily things looking. I don't really know what they're called on the side. Canker. It's good for the Halloween episodes. Yes. Yeah. It had two big cankers, and it was really weeping. Um, it just started to look kind of sickly, and um, well, and the the boxwoods were just way too big for the space. They okay. were. I mean. Yeah, it was just too much in a small space. These plants are out and done. Um, Correct. De describe to me what these planters are like. Are they giant urns like you see outside a hotel? I, I sent you some pictures in the email, but they are literally field stone. And I would say the one on the upside of the hill is about five feet tall and about... Um, it goes about four feet by ten feet. And then the other one is about eight feet by four feet, I guess, on the other side. It's much smaller. Now I see the pictures. These are, they're planting beds made of, like you said, field stone, but they're kind of attractive. Yeah. I have to assume that there's no ground contact on the bottom um, because that's the only way worms could get in there. And I see a drainage okay. pipe on um, mm -hmm. at the bottom of, one, maybe two drainage pipes, and I presume the other one has it, too. Uh-huh. You're right. So you said they're basically four by? Uh, one is like four. It's probably four by ten, the one that's over by the stairs on the upside of the hill. And mm -hmm. the other one's probably about ten feet by two and a half to three feet. Okay. But I tried to dig down mm -hmm. um, after I, you know, to dig out the roots of the tree, and they either threw the extra field stone in there, <laughs> or I, cause I, I started finding big, huge, I mean, huge rock. There was that old theory that you should fill up big planters like this with uh, broken pots and stones and mm -hmm. packing peanuts so you didn't have to spend as much money. Over the fall, which is a really nice time to work outdoors, mm -hmm. um, I, w I would suggest you excavate as much of the soil as you can, and you're probably okay. going to have to leave a couple of big rocks uh, around. Yeah. But if you say they're nice, yeah. um, take the mm -hmm. nice ones and incorporate them into that landscape. Now, okay. Um, and then in the spring, I would suggest you get, um, it, it, is there a way a truck could dump some topsoil at your property or is everything too tight? It's pretty tight, but we could, there are trucks that come through there all the time. So I'm sure we can find someone to come through. Well, and what kind of vehicle do you have? <laughs> we have a Mini Cooper. <laughs> oh, you're a big help. <laughs> Jeez, Louise. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to help too much. If you, you have... surprise how much it carries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, if you have a friend with a pickup truck, one thing, uh -huh. one thing you can do is go to the nearest compost site. I would imagine uh, Cincinnati uh, collects the fall leaves and makes compost from them uh, for the residents. Or a nursery that has a really good reputation and good quality materials mm -hmm. and fill up those big rolling trash cans. Um, I, okay. Ideally, half topsoil, half compost, and buy two big bags of perlite. Uh, okay. That, that's a popped uh, white material. It's mined. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really good for lightening your soil. And okay. I, I would fill the... Um, the enclosures, the garden beds, 50-50 um, compost and topsoil. And as you're filling it up, empty one of those huge bags of perlite into each one. Okay. Then you're going to have fabulous, uh, you're going to have fabulous soil. Um, it would not be cheating if after a rain, there's a bunch of earthworms on the ground uh, to trans mm -hmm. transplant them into the soil. 
And then okay. when you're done that work, you can literally grow anything. What's the sun exposure? It gets pretty much full sun to about two o'clock in the summer, and then um, we're east facing, and but the um, south is uphill, so we don't get as much sun in the winter. I get east. Uh, I get sun from the east, and it's remarkably mm -hmm. good for plants. So uh, you could grow almost anything out there. Do you know what you want to grow? Well, I was gonna. I I like. I didn't, I'm not a big weeping cherry fan, but I liked the fact that when we looked out our front window there, there was that little bit of canopy instead of seeing the street. So I wanted to get another tree that was about eight to 10 feet, but maybe not as um, horizontal, I guess is a good way. Cause right. No, the weeping out into our, in, yeah. 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 No, you can get ornamental cherries that are straight up. The weeping okay. is a human bred variety um, to make it look nice. So um, if you th if you guys are willing to act fast, you, mm -hmm. you can probably get a really high quality pair of cherry trees um, at okay. like maybe 50% off because we're getting into the oh, wow. end of the season and okay. plant them in the fall and they'll do superb. And with any luck, you'll get the cherry blossoms in the spring. I think that's a great oh, yeah, use for those nice. planters, but match them. Okay, I will. Okay, and all that yeah, stuff. All that stuff I talked about. You know, just go to How to Fill a Raised Bed at um, at our archive of old articles, okay. and just do the same thing. You have raised beds; they're just stone instead of wood or metal. Yeah, that's what I was wondering, if I should treat it the same way. I was just scared you were going to tell me I had to keep dumping out the soil every year. And putting new oh, stuff no, in. <laughs> no. That, it makes me feel better. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, once you, get, once you get real good soil in there, all you'll need to do is, you know, add an inch of compost every spring or fall. Oh, wonderful. That's much better news than I thought. <laughs> well, I'm happy to deliver it. <laughs> I appreciate it, and I appreciate all your help. Oh, my pleasure. You take care now. All right. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, it's time for me to take a little break and continue to remind everyone who waits for this time of year to go leaf spotting that the combination of excessive moisture and premature leaf drop creates the perfect environment for ticks to prosper. So be sure to wear permethrin-treated clothing when outdoors have your pets professionally treated, and perform a thorough tick check after every outing. I'm your tick checker, Mike McGrath, and you're listening to You Bet Your Garden from the Univest Studios at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Support for You Bet Your Garden is provided by the Espoma Company, offering a complete selection of natural organic plant foods and potting soils. More information about Espoma and the Espoma Natural Gardening Community can be found at ESPOMA.com. Welcome back to another thrilling episode of You Bet Your Garden. From the Univest Studios at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA, I am your host, Mike McGrath. Have you noticed that a large number of arborvitae are turning brown in weird places? What's going on? Well, I found out what's going on, and I'm going to tell you when we get to the question of the week. In the meantime, more of your fabulous phone calls at 888 492 9444. Carol, welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Thank you, Mike. Hello. Hello. How are you, Carol? Enjoying fine weather here in Lebanon Township, New Jersey, Hunterdon County. Yes, I should. I Well, I should. I shouldn't. I don't know. But I'm going to mention that we are going through an unbelievably beautiful stretch 
of fall. And I can't call it an Indian summer because I don't know about you, but I haven't had any frost yet. I still got tomato plants out there. And we've had four we've had four nights of frost so far. Yeah, I got I, my microclimate is so weird. I'm halfway up. Um, I'm half a mile up on the foothills of South Mountain, and my garden is up high, and there is a frost flow that takes all that cold weather down um, much, much below where I grow my stuff. So I got lucky for a change, <laughs> and uh, but this weather in the 70s is beautiful. It is. All right. What can we do you for? I was interested in the caller who was talking about her Indian meal moth infestation last week. Right. And you very, very rightly told her uh, about cleaning out her cabinets, not with bleach, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, but I also wanted to alert people to the fact that the bird seed that we're all buying at this time of year to feed the returning winter birds can be infested. The only time I had a problem with Indian meal moths, I traced it back to a bag of sunflower seed. And so you need to check those, make sure that you store the seed well. I only buy small quantities, so I'm able to store it in clean, dry plastic jugs from milk or water or juice. And that seems to work fine for me. But be careful about bringing them in because sometimes you bring in an infested bag and don't realize it. Well, these meal moths, pantry moths, grain moths, um, they have been around for untold millennia. For as long as people have stored grain, this nasty little insect has adapted to feeding on the grain and then metamorphosizing into a moth and laying eggs where? In the grain. So it is, <laughs> you know, it's a perpetual motion machine. And like I said last time, you can only imagine what it's like when you've got grain silos and stuff. Yes, I can't imagine that. <laughs> it must be like they think it's the Garden of Eden. Um, I want to reiterate um, that I do not approve of feeding seed to birds. But I'm also going to add that if you're going to feed seed to birds, the dead of winter is the time to do it. You're not going to interfere with the hatchlings of spring being confused about where their food comes from. Um, the Humane Society, many other organizations are begging people to stop feeding seed when um, hatching is occurring because they want the baby birds to learn where the food is in the wild. Also, as the weather warms up, bird feeders are a source of really devastating diseases on the bird population. They get these eye infections, because you know, they're all clustered there and they're pooping on the seed as they're eating it. And it's just a bad idea. But thinking it over, I don't have a huge problem with feeding the seed in the winter other than you're encouraging those servants of Satan, evil squirrels who are attracted to bird feeders more than birds are. And always remember with sunflower seed, they are allopathic. Any seed that gets dropped on the ground is not only fodder for rats and mice and voles, uh, but it can make that uh, the soil underneath ungrowable for many other plants, which is why I always suggest that people, um, when the weather gets cold, I'm going to put mine out pretty soon, hang suet feeders. Suet feeders have more fat and protein than sunflower seeds, and they don't attract vermin, and uh, it's a great thing. And, and you'll see just as many birds, if not more. I had a pileated woodpecker at mine last year, and that was amazing. Um, so you're still feeding the birds, but there's no downside. But again, you want to feed some sunflower seed in the dead of winter, go ahead, just keep the feeder clean and stop feeding 
when nesting is over and baby birds are being hatched. I will also reveal uh, a trick that I learned um, helping people who were growing their own storage beans, uh, like pinto beans and navy beans and stuff like that that you would make soups and stews from over the winter, that if you think they have been infested or attacked by weevils, um, you put the beans in the freezer for a couple of days, and that kills the weevils. So same thing, especially with this. Um, if it's freezing outside, or even just overnights when it gets colder, put your packaged bird seed out there, and you may well kill um, the moths and the caterpillars and the eggs before they have a chance to wreak mischief. I, I bowled her over. <laughs> well, I don't put feeders out because we have black bears. We scatter our seeds on the steps of our porch and just a few at a time so the birds come in, clean it up, and there's that. But, so we don't have the feeder problem because, as I said, we've got black bears. They've looked in our windows. <laughs> you know, I have lived out in the country uh, for close to 40 years now. I've seen wild turkeys. We've always had a nest of red-tailed hawks on our property. We have every kind of bird and rodent you can imagine. And I've never seen a bear. I'm, I'm like, almost disappointed. <laughs> Magnificent uh, creatures, that's for sure. Yeah, and, and having grown up as a kid in Philadelphia, I would expect the, the bear to be wearing uh, a hat and carrying a picnic basket. So, you know, maybe it's... <laughs> and riding, riding a bicycle, too. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, that's something we did not address. And yes, that is a prime source of pantry moth infestations. So I, I hope you have an outbuilding or a shed or something like that. Just keep the seed in there so it doesn't get into the house. That's and, a good idea. And of course, okay, Mike, thank you very much. Of course, in the in the classic cartoon tradition, make up a big sign that says no bird seed in here. <laughs> yes, indeed. All right. Good luck to you, Carol. Thank you very much, Mike. Bye -bye. My pleasure. Bye bye. 888-492-9444. Casey. At the bat, welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Well, I hope I don't strike out, Mike. How are you today? I am just ducky and bobbling. <laughs> you know, my Phillies won the, won the pennant, so I'm a happy boy. Uh, how are you, sir? If I was doing any better, I'd be a McGrath. <laughs> oh, boy, I got everybody fooled, don't I? And where is Casey? <laughs> Casey's in the Midlands of South Carolina in Lexington. Oh, okay. So you're inland. Yes. So, what, you know, generally South Carolina has a very mild climate. Um, is yours any different than that? Are you at elevation or anything? No elevation. Uh, pr pretty mild. Uh, usually around mid-November we get a good hard freeze, and then it kind of cools off from there. Okay. So you do get freezing temps. Yes. Okay. Very good. What can we do you for, sir? Well, my wife and I would like to plant some flowers that will bloom uh, through this fall and into the winter, hopefully perennials. I know that may not be an option, but we didn't know if pansies were our only option and if they would make it past the hard freeze. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they will. Uh, pansies are remarkable. Uh, you know, instead of being, quote, a pansy, they're the toughest flowers around. You plant them in the fall, and uh, they will bloom uh, e even through the first frost. And they may go a little dormant if you get a rough winter with snow, uh, but they will stay alive, and then they will bloom like crazy um, as soon as the weather warms up. Their only uh, problem, so to speak, is that they can't stand really high temperatures. So when we hit summertime, sometime in July, they tend to wither up and pass away. 
but um, pansies do have a habit of self-seeding. I remember I grew uh, a whole bunch of pansies a couple years ago on my front patio, which is stamped concrete. And it has these little uh, openings in it to allow for freeze and thaw. Uh, the next spring, it was crazy. Every little line, every little space was covered with pansies that were growing out of whatever dirt got blown into there. So in that way, they're kind of perennial, but you're not going to see them in July and August. Very good. Now, let me see. Um, in winter, um, well, at least fall into winter, I tend to think down south, crepe myrtle which is, to the best of my knowledge, one of, if not the last plant to bloom. And those blooms tend to hold on. So I think that would be a good choice. I'm trying to remember the name of the plant. And my friend Barry is going to kill me because he has a nursery, and I believe it's in West Virginia, uh, Sunshine Gardens. And he sells... Uh, these remarkable perennial plants, um, one of which the common name is the Christmas lily, uh, because it will often bloom right around Christmas time. The blooms persist. Again, it's a perennial, and deer and rabbits and evil squirrels won't bother it. It's driving me crazy now. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll scream it halfway home when we're done the show. And, um, but if you go to Sunshine Gardens and you find Barry, you'll see an incredible variety of these things. It's like eating away at part of my brain trying to get out. <laughs> um, fall into winter, um, that's pansy time, absolutely. Uh, another very good plant would be holly because obviously of uh, the leaves persist in the fall, the berries come out. And although there are different color hollies, like my blue holly, sorry, the fruits are all red. It's the leaves that are said to look blue. <laughs> but again, there's another deer-proof plant. Um, it doesn't need protection. I've never seen rabbits nibble at the bark or anything like that. And it really is a plant with four-season interest. Now, if you want to go crazy, um, uh, weeping willows um, are the first plants to bloom um, in the spring. And, you know, they can bloom again right around Christmas time. There's another plant like it that is escaping my brain here, which is getting old and atrophied. And um, very tiny spring bulbs. Uh, they used to call them minor bulbs, M-I-N-O-R. Now they call them special bulbs. Uh, but bulbs like Glory of Snow, Snowdrops, um, these tend to bloom, again, right around Christmas time. And they can persist until the, the quote, normal bulbs uh, come up things like, uh, you know, daffodils. So I don't know if any of that suits your needs. It all sounds great to me, Mike. Witch hazel. That's the, the other one that blooms at around the same time as willows. And you know the display that witch hazel puts on. It's just, ama just amazing. So I think, I think in your climate, you've got, you've got a good number of plants. But please go crazy on pansies. And in the, in the spring, when they really start to bloom crazily, don't forget that you can eat the flowers. The flowers are, really? are edible. And, you know, you put like a dozen pansy flowers on top of a green salad, and suddenly that's something you'll charge 50 bucks for at a restaurant in New York. They are also incredibly nutritious. They are the only plant source, edible plant source of rutin. R-U-T-I-N, um, a nutrient that is really hard to find otherwise, but it actually strengthens your capillary walls. Um, so it can reduce or eliminate the look of varicose or spider veins, 
and it's good for heart health too. The stronger your ca capillary walls are, um, the better the blood flows. Mike, that's some amazing knowledge you have inside of that yeah, slightly if I, if aged only, brain of yours. Yeah, if I could only remember the plants that Barry sells. <laughs> 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 I think I left a runner on third here, you know. And as soon as you're gone, I'll remember it, I swear, you know. That's the way it works. All right. Well, thank you. That's a great question. Thank you. Thank you for your wealth of knowledge. Have a great day. You too, sir. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, it's time for me to take a little break and announce that at least two of the places I've personally appeared in the past are having me back. It's amazing how many people have short memories. So I am scheduled to appear at the Mohegan Sun Event Center in Wilkesboro the first weekend in February, and in Ventnor, cooler by a mile, New Jersey at the end of July. That's going to be sweet. Stay tuned for details and tall tales. I'm on the road again, Mike McGrath, and you're listening to You Bet Your Garden from the Univest Studios at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. This is 91.3 FM, WLVR Bethlehem, WLVR.org. Welcome back to another thrilling episode of You Bet Your Garden from the Univest Studios at Lehigh Valley Public Media in soon to be the Christmas city, Bethlehem, PA. That's right, it's time to start getting those gifts, cats and kittens. But for now, we are in the stretch. In just a little bit, we'll get to a very important question of the week about a pair of pathogens that are attacking Arborvitae and what you can do to prevent it or try to cure it. That's really important, and it's coming up after a couple more of your fabulous phone calls at 888-492-9444. Linda, welcome to You Bet Your Garden. Thank you. How are you today, Mike? I am just ducky. Where are you? I'm in Pennington, New Jersey. So my problem, I have two beautiful trees. They're probably about eight years old. We planted them two years ago. One is a red bud and one is a dogwood. Okay. And they're planted in a meadow kind of area of my backyard. We only mow it every two or three years. Okay. And over this past winter either mice or voles or something, uh, decided to make camp at the bottom of the dogwood, mm -hmm. and they chewed the bark about six inches up from the ground and made a complete ring all the way around the tree. Uh. And I'm afraid it's lost. Well, you know that the, your meadow uh, gives mice and voles excellent cover uh, yeah. to get in there and nibble at the bark. Um uh, did they touch the dogwood? No, uh, they did the dogwood. The red bud is still good, okay. so I want to protect that over the winter. I'm, I'm figuring I need to mow around it and then cut everything way back so there's nothing next to the trunk that is attractive. But I didn't know if there was anything we could do to save the dogwood. I don't think the mowing is necessary because they're just going to hang out in the long grass and you know take a short walk over to your bark. Uh, oh. But you can buy at any nursery, uh, nursery or garden center tree guards, and there's many. Okay. There's many types. Um, when fruit trees, young fruit trees, are sold, they almost always include a tree guard. And one of the most interesting is it's just a long strip of white plastic that's continuous, so it's really easy to wrap around the tree but it's a deterrent. Um, since this sounds like an out-of-the-way area, you could also just get chicken wire or welded wire fencing and make a little cage around it, not touching the trunk of the tree. Now, I know that everybody will try to sell you products to repair the damage. The only thing that can repair the damage is the tree itself. 
anything you apply uh, to the damage is going to make things worse. Okay. Now, um, so this happened last winter? Yes, and it bloomed and uh, did really well all summer and has beautiful leaves that are turning now. It, it looks good. And then nothing's wrong. You always, uh, really? You okay. always, I know the line is anytime the bark is girdled, the tree is dead. But that's not true of all trees. Uh, for instance, the tree that we get cork from, close up our wine bottles, that cork is the bark, and it's harvested regularly, and the tree doesn't mind. Same with cinnamon. That is the outer bark of a tropical tree. So there are, there are plants in there that can survive this. But you appear to have done the best thing possible in this situation, which is nothing. <laughs> and it's the hardest thing for gardeners to do because we always want to help the plants. Um, but a lot of times the best thing to do is let nature take its course. And if that tree, uh, you know, put out its leaves and bloomed, you don't have any tr you don't have any problem there. But I would make sure you protect it, um, like now, with tree guards okay. or caging, so that the yeah um, we had we had loose caging up to keep the deer from rubbing on it. Right. So I think we just need to get down to the ground. I'll get a tree tree guards. Yes, because. Um, with some, for instance, with chicken wire, I now think about it, mice and voles can go right through the holes. So I think you want to invest in a couple of real tree guards. And they're not expensive. It should be easy. Okay. It should, just make sure you take them off in the spring. All right. Because especially if they're covering a wound, you don't want them to get sucked in there, so to speak. Okay. Great. Well, I'm glad there's hope for the dogwood. Thank you very much. All right, it's time for a very important question of the week. Why are my arbor vitae turning brown? Ed from Delaware left us this phone message. My emerald arbor vitae are starting to die. They're turning brown. What could be the cause of this? I have 15 of them, and five are turning brown. <laughs> yeah, and I'll bet they're all in the middle, right, Ed? Well, we were originally going to have Ed ask his question on the show in a phone call, and I figured I would offer my usual answers. Wood mulch touching the trunks of the trees, chemical lawn treatments near the trees, poor drainage, trees planted too deep in the ground, a nearby neighbor spraying herbicides on windy days, or sunspots. But we've gotten this question a lot lately, and I wondered if something else was a foot or a tree. So I decided to investigate and turn it into a question of the week if I found something other than the usual suspects. And did I ever? It wasn't easy, but I finally located a bulletin from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst that told me all about Arbor vitae needle blight. Anyone who has any type of arbor vitae on their property should read this bulletin. We'll include the link when we post this article at the Gardens Alive website. Anyway, two pathogens are responsible. Both are poorly understood, virtually unpronounceable, and at least one was unknown before 1989. Note, all arbor vitae are members of the Thuga family, T-H-U-G-A, which is why you'll see variations of this word throughout. I quote from the bulletin. Oh, God, am I going to have to? I'm not going to try to pronounce this thing. <laughs> Let's just call it Philo, okay, because that's, that's how it starts out. It is believed that Philo is the primary species encountered. This fungus was first described in 1989 and is thought to occur only on Thuja species. But based on submissions to the University of Massachusetts Plant Pathology Lab, 
This pathogen can also be found on ladle and cypress, false cypress, Japanese cedar, and juniper slash red cedar. Infected arborvitae typically have blighted needle tips and or discolored pale green to yellow needles that may appear desiccated, means they're dried out. Infections often initiate at the needle tip and progress inwards. During wet weather, black pads of fungal tissue rupture through the epidermis on symptomatic needles to release large volumes of spores, which are then blown or splashed onto nearby shoots to initiate new infections. Now, because arborvitae have dense canopies, especially those that have been pruned for deep density, ideal conditions exist for the development of this pathogen. Most infections are likely to become established during wet weather in the spring when new needles are emerging and not yet fully developed. However, the pathogen may also be actively sporulating during the autumn season, especially when moisture is abundant. Overly aggressive pruning and winter injury are likely the most important stresses that lead to infection. The fungus invades the plant at the tips of new shoots, or it can utilize pruning wounds as a source of entry. Once established, it causes browning and dieback that can eventually kill small branches. Overall, the second pathogen, which we're going to call pesta, is more aggressive in comparison to the other one because of its ability to attack stems and small branches. Phylo is primarily restricted to the needles. Pesta is opportunistic and attacks weakened plants, predisposed to infection by drought, insect feeding, mechanical damage, and planting stress. This fungus is a known endophyte meaning that it can live dormant within the plant without causing disease, an adaption that allows it to readily overwinter in asymptomatic plant tissue. Pesta produces small pads of fungal tissue underneath the epidermis of the plant, and when moisture is abundant, the pads rupture, producing a long black mass of spores. During wet weather, these spores are blown and splashed onto healthy nearby plant parts, initiating new infection centers. The best course of action for management of any needle or shoot blight pathogen is to prune and discard as many infected plant parts as possible. Dead shoots and needles harbor the fungal pathogens and allow them to overwinter in the tree canopy. When they sporulate, or is it sporulate? I don't know, I just love that word. From the dead tissue the following spring, the spores are in very close proximity to newly developing and susceptible plant tissue. On well-established mature trees, this level of pruning can be a daunting task, but a necessary one if the disease is to be successfully controlled. However, It is important to keep in mind that spores travel long distances and both pathogens are widespread in the environment. Avoid pruning during wet weather as this is the time when the fungus is most actively producing and disseminating spores. Avoid watering with overhead sprinklers that wet the foliage, which allows moisture to linger on the needles, facilitating spore production and germination. Drip irrigation or hand watering of newly planted trees is preferable." End quote. Now the author, Nicholas Brazy, goes on to mention the importance of cleaning the forest floor, as any infected needles or branches not cleaned up are capable of spreading the fungus. He also recommends the ancient organic herbicide copper as a way to prevent or control the disease. Plants should be sprayed with copper in the spring and fall, 
ideally as a preventative before symptoms emerge. Sunlight is important as well. Although somewhat shade tolerant, these plants do best in full sun. The more shade, the better the chance that these two fungi will thrive. I'm a fungi. On a more positive note, kind of, the wood of arborvitae is highly rot resistant. I did not know that. And would serve well as a frame for raised beds or a compost bin. So if you wind up cutting down any trees, Well, that sure was some depressing information about arborvitae blight, now wasn't it? Luckily for you, the question of the week appears in print at the Gardens Alive website. To read it over at your leisure or your leisure or whatever, just click the link for the question of the week at our website, which is still and will forever be youbetyourgarden.org. Gardens Alive supports the You Bet Your Garden Question of the Week, and you'll always find the latest question of the week and old ones at the Gardens Alive website. Yikes, my producer is threatening to attack my arbor if I don't get my Vitae out of this studio. <laughs> we must be out of time. But you can call us anytime at 888-492-9444. We actually got rid of the old calls, and you can really leave a message now. Or send us your email, your tired, your poor, your wretched refuse teeming towards our garden shore at ybyg at wlvt.org. Yeah, and we fixed the problem with the emails, too. Hey, always include your location. You Bet Your Garden is a half-hour public television show, an hour-long public radio show and podcast, all produced and delivered to you weekly, so I think it's strongly, from the Univest Studios at Lehigh Valley Public Media in Bethlehem, PA. Our radio show is distributed by PRX, the public radio exchange. You Bet Your Garden was created by Mike McGrath. Mike McGrath was created when he awoke one night to find Captain Nemo's Nautilus in his front yard. The living legend of South Street, Ken Queter, is our musical director. Our chief content officer is Yoni Greenbaum. Our angel of the airways is Christine Dempsey. Our sound engineer is the almost always cheerful Charlie Sarah. Sorry about your mess, Charlie. Our social media director is Amanda Norfleet. Check out her fine work and send her pretty garden pictures of your place so she can post them at the You Bet Your Garden Facebook page. Teresa Radke is our peerless princess of profound production. The always lovely Jonas Bowen is our audio editor. Judicious Jake Boyer takes care of the video. Our directorial director of direction is the harassed and harried Javier Diaz. As always, special thanks to our beloved band of hoodlums, thieves, and card sharks, Zach the Tack, Jacob Morris, and anybody else hanging out in the control room. Mm, or is that hiding out? Our beloved and bedraggled CEO, Tim Fallon, is wandering the hallways muttering, my name is George Tirebiter. I never lie, and I'm always right. I'm your host, Mike McGrath, and I'm watching helplessly as evil squirrels replace my spring bulbs and garlic with black walnuts. And I'll be cursing those long-tailed servants of Satan until I can see you again next week. <laughs>